Well, good evening. Welcome you to our Tuesday Bible study. I can't believe we are almost at the end of October. I'm sure you can't either. And so let us lift you up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you brought us through this far this year. It's been a challenging year. And I know that we are all becoming a little frustrated and discouraged, especially as we spent so much time away from each other. We've reorganized our church and how it works. We've uh, rethought our, our jobs, our home life, just all of these things. And once again, this coronavirus is just creeping its head and growing, not just in this country, but all over the world again. It just is it's just so frustrating. And I know that people are discouraged. We pray that you would help us through this season. And uh, certainly our lesson today from the Old Testament, I think, will be of benefit for us, especially as we are discouraged. May your blessing be with us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I did mention to you that I think today's lesson actually is really applicable today. Um, we are reading from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, 1 to 12. But I, I would point out to you a number. A number that's really important that we don't see in our lesson for today, but is a part of the overarching theme that maybe we've been looking at. That's at number 40. 40 is really important. 40, 40, days, uh, 40 days and nights of rain, Noah. Of course, this time of, of testing, this season. We had 40 years in the wilderness of the Jews, and that's kind of applicable to today. 40 days of temptation for Jesus in the wilderness. <clears throat> 40 is a lengthy season of preparation, of testing, uh, of, of frustration uh, before we ultimately are revealed to us what God wants to do for us. So it could be, it's a tough season of testing for us. And I think that's really appropriate for us as we go through this season. This is going to be a season and a continued season of testing for us. But we want to look at how the Jews dealt with their season of testing, that 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness. We will not hopefully be through this for 40 months even. But they went through a 40 season. And at the end of that season of temptation, they were on the outside looking in. That's kind of our lesson for today. Now you notice, we're reading from the book of Deuteronomy. You might be saying, well, wait a minute, I thought we were in Exodus. We were. We're doing uh, the stories of Moses. However, we've come to the end of the book of Exodus and the people who created our lectionary thought the best way to end the book of Exodus is actually with this lesson from Deuteronomy 34 because it answers some of the questions about what happened to Moses. All right, so let me read that to you. So Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across Jericho and there the Lord showed him the entire land from Gilead to Dan all of the Naphtali, the territories of Ephraim, the Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land that I promised an oath to you, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give to you it to you and to your descendants. I will let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. And the Lord said, as the Lord had said, he buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where the grave is. He said, Notice that today. It was God's hand that buried Moses. Very poetic, a very beautiful thing. <clears throat> Moses was 120 years old. Three times 40. I don't know that we're necessarily supposed to take this number of 120 years literalistically. He could have been 70 years of age. He could have been 90. He could have been 100. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is he had three seasons of testing. Okay? This is the point of that number. If you notice his life, the three seasons of testing. Of course, growing up uh, uh, in, in uh, Egypt, as a prince, then of course his time in the wilderness uh, as, as, as a farmer, as a shepherd, and then of course his time leading the people of Israel. So he, you know, he had three seasons 
of his life that were lengthy and testing. Let's go on with that. So he's 120 years of age when he died, and his eyes were not weak, or his eye, but yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. He was a robust man. The morning was over. Uh, the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plain of Mo uh, Moab for 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord commanded, had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Remember we talked about last week, nobody saw God without dying. Well, here Moses finally got to see God face to face. Kind of disproving this idea that if you see God, you die. Uh, he, he did all of these signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all of the officials, to his entire land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Okay, this is just fabulous. This is kind of the ending of this Moses story, and it kind of puts a nice little cherry on top and says, wasn't that great? This man was a fantastic person. Now, as I said to you, I noticed, I noticed how he said we're in Deuteronomy today rather than Exodus. And as I mentioned to you, Deuteronomy is a much more satisfactory conclusion to the life of Moses. And I think that's why the lectionary folks wanted us to end on Deuteronomy here. Now, I think that there is a, as I've been trying to point out to you, a theme from Genesis that runs all the way to the end of Deuteronomy. Okay? There are multiple themes, obviously, that the, the, the story is trying to develop, but this is known as the Pentateuch, these five books. It's also known as Hmm, let me see. The law or the books of Moses. Are you, do I got you looking sideways right now? Whoa, going downhill. The books of Moses. Now, this word of in Hebrew, it doesn't mean what we think it means. There are some people who take from this, oh, they're books written by Moses. There is absolutely zero evidence that Moses wrote these books. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that he did not write these books. Genesis to Deuteronomy were written in Hebrew. Moses died before the language of Hebrew was invented. The language of Hebrew was invented in 950 AD. Now, again, we mentioned this a couple, I, I don't remember when, but I know we mentioned it, that 950 AD kind of coincides with the reign of David, the king. Okay? Makes sense. This new Semitic language. Uh, Moses would not have spoken Hebrew. It was written in Hebrew. So who wrote this? This was written long after Moses. Okay? The books of Moses, pertaining to Moses, uh, about Moses, doesn't mean that there are books written by Moses. Um, so these were probably written a long time after Moses. However, some of these things might have pre-existed. He might have put his hand uh, pen to, uh, uh, ink, uh, ink to paper or something like that, or vellum, I should say. Um, uh, papyrus, would, you know, we're probably using papyrus rather than vellum. Vellum was a uh, later innovation. Nevertheless, uh, they were, he, he may have written something, and these things were passed on and eventually put into this book or with the surrounding story. But the point is, is that they wanted a good ending to the story. So we have this great ending of Moses' life. And I said to you that there's a larger theme at play here in the Pentateuch, these five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First of all, it's about God, okay? But God focused through Moses. God comes to us through Moses. God, the God of the Jews, is unlike any other God. In fact, you notice there is a growth in the relationship of the people of Israel with God. When they first meet God, God is like, oh, one of many gods, but this God is paying attention to us. Isn't that great? We, we love this God. And then, well, you know, our God is the best of all gods. Well, and then eventually, through the revelation of the divine name, the Jews begin to realize 
there is only one God. They then eventually became monotheists, believers in one God. So we see in Genesis through Deuteronomy the growth of their faith. There are many gods, but we like this one. Our God is the best of the gods. Our God is the only God. There's a growth in their understanding of who God is. And it comes to fruition in this guy, Moses. But here's the thing. This God, unlike the other gods, does not reside in the mountains. Okay? Zeus resides in the mountains. Mount Olympus. Okay? Baal resides in Mount Carmel. This God in Genesis resides amongst us. That's the whole point of Genesis chapter 1, is the seventh day. Which, by the way, this is kind of a cool little tidbit here. Baal didn't have an appropriate residence in which to reside, and so his sister came and appealed to El, Remember how we mentioned to you that's a generic name for God? He appealed to El and said, El, Baal doesn't have an appropriate home in which to reside. We need a home made for him. So they made a home out of him, a, a, a big temple made out of bricks that was tested for seven days with fire and became a temple of gold worthy of the god Baal. Do you see these themes that are, are developing here? The Bible picks up on that and says, well, you know what? The temple in which God resides is the earth with us. On the seventh day, God resided with us. This is the most important day. It most certainly was meant to be a pushback against Baal. and says, see, God made a temple on Mount Carmel. This God, after seven days, made his home amongst us mortals. That's kind of a cool little thing. I don't think I've ever mentioned to you before, but I hope it's kind of exciting. It's one of those really cool things that distinguish between the God of the Jews and the God of everybody else. This God doesn't live amongst the mountains. This God wants to live amongst us. Here's the problem. There's a big but. There's a big but. We destroyed relationship with God. The whole book of Genesis goes on to how we destroyed relationship with God and how God continued to try to reconcile relationship with us, ultimately coming to fruition in the Jewish way of thinking in Moses. Moses is finally made through God. Through Moses, God finally worked to reconcile relationship with the Jews who would then reconcile relationship with with the entire world. But it's interesting to notice how the book of Deuteronomy ends, that last book of the book of Moses. And I cannot stress this to you enough. This is something else we probably haven't talked about. For the Jews, the law, or the books of Moses, for many, many, many generations and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years were the only Bible that they had. So I want you to imagine their Bible ends with this passage. All right, they didn't have... We, we go on to... Next week we're going to start looking at Joshua. It's kind of cool. Um, so we're going to take a look at the... Uh, occupation of the land of Canaan starting next week but in their case this was the only book that they had they didn't have any other books it ended right here with Moses dying and the Jews on the outside looking in they were looking at the promised land but they didn't have the opportunity to end it imagine that's the way your Bible ends so this is the Bible that they had this is what they're reading. God brought them through Moses right to the precipice of the promised land, and that was it. Story's over. <laughs> well, we know it's not over because we're, we're Christians, and the Jews knew it wasn't over too. 
But it's important to understand that there is a theological reason why these five books end with the Jews on the outside looking in. And we're going to talk about that. Why could it be? And it has to do with, first of all, you know, Moses. I mean, we did talk about Moses. And he was a great guy. He was a great man. It ends with that. He was just such a fantastic prophet. And there's never been one like him ever since. That's what the Bible says right here. He was a great man. But as great as Moses was, not even Moses got to enter into the promised land. And so now here we have the Jews on the outside looking in. Why would the story end this way? Why? Remember how I told you this story is meant to be timeless. In other words, it is about a particular time in history, but it's kind of removed from some of that context for us so that we understand that this book is written for us. It wasn't written to us, but it was definitely written for us. We are meant to take something from this. If it's just a story, true as, it, as we believe it may be, but if it's just a story about the Jews being taken from Egypt out of slavery to the brink of the promised land, it doesn't mean anything to us. So what? There's a meaning to this that we are meant to understand from the Jews being brought to the precipice, right to the edge, right to the, uh, to the promised land, but not being able to enter into it. Neither can Moses. Why would it end that way? It doesn't make sense. You'd think it should end in a victory. It doesn't. It ends with a yearning. And I think this is the most important reason for this book to be, these five books to be written this way. It ends with a yearning. With us looking into the promised land and saying, but I'm not there yet. Isn't this our story? This is a story of us humans. I still haven't found what I'm looking for to quote that U2 song. There's that yearning. We've never quite arrived. And there's a reason why we've never quite arrived. Because of us. We are violent. We are destructive. We destroy relationship with each other. Please just take a look at what's going on in this election. We're tearing each other apart. We are killing each other both literally and not literally. Metaphorically. We're killing each other. We're coming up with excuses why we no longer have to uh, care for one another. The yearning is the land of Cana. Oh, but to be back in relationship with God and the land of Cana. Well, you know what's going to have to happen for us to get back in relationship with God? We need to remove that big obstacle that prevents us from being in that land of Cana. Us. See, the Jews did not, believe it or not, interpret this literalistically. By the time the Jews... Uh, came to a, a deeper understanding of their relationship with God, they were out of the promised land. They didn't last very long in the promised land. And they interpret that as because of their unfaithfulness, because they were the obstacle to their relationship with God. So God now comes to them in a book. So the Jews are no longer the people of the land. They're no longer the people of the promised land. Cana now represents for them that intimate relationship with God. But they really had no desire to go back to Cana. The only people who wanted to put them back in Cana were racist Christians who, were, who called themselves Zionists, who wanted to get the Jews out of Europe and out of their country and out of their land and oh, put them in the promised land where the Bible prophecies can be fulfilled and the world can come to an end. But they don't really care about the Jews. The Jews never wanted to return to Cana except as a yearning representing their desire to be in relationship with God. 
The Zionist movement was not a Jewish movement, by the way. The Jews vehemently resisted resettling in a literalistic fashion in the land of Canaan, what we now call Israel. Literally, they just vehemently opposed that. All the religious leaders and all the academic biblical scholars thought that this was a horrible idea. Zionist Christians thought it was a great idea. We get them out of our country. Yes! This book ends with a yearning. Our desire to be in relationship with God. Our home is with God in Cana, not a literalistic land. Again, we are the reason why, we are the stumbling block that prevents us from having this idyllic image as created in Genesis 1 of God residing amongst us. We are the reason why we continue to yearn and look, are on the outside looking in. We continue to be stiff-necked people. And you know, when we get into the other books that are written, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, you know, First and Second Samuel, we get into First and Second Kings and all these books, we see again and again and again, this is played out, they finally enter into the promised land, and what do they do? They destroy it all like we've always done because we are the stumbling block that prevents that intimate relationship with God. We continue to be stiff-necked. We continue to be destructive in our relationships with one another. But yet we still long for that relationship with God to enter into the, year, the, the end, land of Cana. And here's the other good news. God yearns for us to enter into that rest. Oh, okay. I want you to see this. We yearn for what? For God. We're on the outside looking in. But here's the great news. God oh, yearns for us. Better yet, maybe what I should say is God yearns for you. Okay? God wants to reconcile relationship with us. This is why Deuteronomy ends with us on the outside looking in. It's very real. It's a human story. It's our story. We always feel like we have never yet arrived. But God is faithful because really, this is the most important part of the book of Exodus. God is faithful. While we continue to be the stumbling block that destroys our relationship with God and one another, God is relentless. God is relentless in his love for us and doesn't let it end with us looking on the, outs on the outside looking in. <laughs> I hope that's good news for you tonight. You're here. But God is here. God has not given up on you. God wants you to enjoy that rest in his loving arms in Canaan. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this lesson, uh, for this wonderful repository of good news that the Jews have passed on to us. And it wasn't about it. Israel or the stupid land of Canaan. In their belief system, they destroyed that relationship. And so that was no longer promised to them. But you never gave up on them. You were relentless in your love, and so you gave them a book to remind them of the love that you have for them, which, again, they were faithful to pass on to us. We have been so richly blessed. We thank you for those people of faith, the Jews that have gone before us, and those who have truly shown us the way, how the deep love of God is relentless, and even when we feel like we're on the outside looking in, and we just feel like we're not making any progress, we're going through this terrible season of drought, 
you will not give up on us and you will make sure that we're shepherded home. We just give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.